In chapter 7, part 1, we're going to discuss the effect of nuclear charge. So before we talk about that, one of the things we want to think about is the periodic table. So we have looked at the periodic table pretty often in Gen Chem 1, but aside from the molecular weight and the symbol for a peri any element, what else can this periodic table? So the periodic table is an organizational chart that allows us to determine the number of electrons, average atomic weight, and trends. So the modern periodic table was developed by two scientists, Mendeleev and Meyer. So as you can see over here, this is the figure from Mendeleev's paper. So I want to give you, or I want to highlight a couple of things. So what you'll notice is there are a couple of places where he's left blanks. And so we can see those right here. And so Mendeleev predicted elements that we were later, later able to identify based on the periodic trends. And so some of the things that he looks at in the table are things that we don't talk about much anymore. But what we do know is that it does show us that the trends in the periodic table, so both location and arrangement, tell us how the element will behave. And so we can think about that in terms of reactivity. We can think about that in terms of the number of electrons. And so what we saw in chapter six is that the location tells us also about where the electrons are in the orbitals. So in chapter seven, we're gonna talk about periodic trends. So the first trend we're going to talk about is the effective nuclear charge. So effective nuclear charge is about how much of the nuclear charge does any electron see. So if we know that sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons, to make it neutral, the question is how much of the 11 plus nuclear charge does, we have the n equals one, n equals two, and the n equals three shell. And so in the n equals three shell, there is a single lone electron. And so the question is how much of the charge of the nuclear charge does this electron C or if you don't like the word C we can think sense so when we think about what does it sense the question is what do we mean by that so we can all imagine that if you had a different electron one that was right here this is going to interact with all or the most of the nuclear charge. And so by contrast, when we think about this electron out here, this one is going to be shielded by the core electrons. So don't forget that a core electron, core electrons are electrons in fully filled shells. So in this case, it is shielded by the electrons in the n equals one or the n equals two charge. So what we can think about is both distance as well as arrangement of electrons is gonna tell us how much of it we can um, sense. So if you wanted to calculate that, the electrostatic force is K, Q1, Q2 over distance. So if you use that in terms of this graphic, we can say that the bigger the distance, the smaller the electric charge. And as the charges move apart, the further apart they are, the less they sense each other.
the last they sense each other. So the Z effective that we're going to talk about is a relative measurement as to how far apart these are. So Z effective can be calculated. So Z effective, or you may have also encountered Z effective as Z star. These terms are interchangeable. The textbook uses Z effective in this case. So it is the effective nuclear charge. So you could think about this as how much of the charge does it sense? And so Z effective is less than Z, where Z is the nuclear charge, otherwise known as the number of protons. And so in order to calculate Z effective, it is just the nuclear charge minus the shielding coefficient. shielding or screening constant. And so this number is always positive. So for any element, we can calculate Z effective where it's the nuclear charge minus the shielding coefficient. But the question is, how do you calculate S? So the thing with S is it's different for every electron. And the other thing we have to think about is that it matters whether it's in a full shell or a part of a partially filled shell. And what is the arrangement in this case? So in one of the things we're going to think about is what does the effective actually look like and what does that trend look like? So one of the things we're going to look at is I'm going to draw a plot of a couple of different things. And so in this case, I'm going to draw the atomic number, or on this axis, it's atomic number, otherwise known as Z. And on this axis, it's going to be Z effective. And so the question we have is, what does it look like if we plot Z effective? So if we start at the atomic number three, As it, we go across the row, it's going to increase. When we get to 10, then it's going to go back down. Went down a little far. And then we're going to see the same trend until we get to 18, and then we're going to go back down. So if you were to connect this as a line, what you see is kind of a sawtooth pattern where as we plot the atomic number by the Z effective, we see that it increases for a period of time and then it goes down and then we see the same pattern. So Z effective is the nuclear charge and how much we're gonna sense this. So as we think about Z effective in terms of the nuclear charge, maybe we can start to make sense of this atomic trend. So if we think about the periodic table, Z effective increases as you go across. And then as you go down, it slightly increases. So why does it go increase as you go across? So Z effective increases across a row. due to increasing nuclear charge, but the same distance. So if we want to think about the effective, let's think about we have a nucleus. We're not looking at the n equals 1 or the n equals 2 shell, 
But we're thinking about the n equals 3 shell. If every time we add another electron, they're really not being shielded any differently than they were from the first electron to the last electron being added because they're all at roughly the same distance to the nucleus. So the distance from the nucleus is approximately the same, but the charge on the nucleus increases. And so we talk a lot about Z effective because Z effective controls many of the other trends we're gonna look at in this section and in this chapter. So let's look at an example. So we wanna rank from the highest to the lowest Z effective. So you wanna look at the periodic table and look at the arrangements. So periodic trends can really only be compared between elements that are near each other or follow the trends. You can't just pick four random elements on the periodic table. It gets a little complicated. So I like to look at who's gonna have the highest and who's gonna have the lowest. So krypton will have the highest and potassium will have the lowest. So then we need to think about the ones in the center. So it turns out that selenium has more than cobalt, which has more than rubidium. So the ranking of these has to do with their location on the periodic table.